Testing, one, two, testing. This meeting will begin in one minute. Good morning, everybody. We'll begin our meeting this morning in our usual fashion by all rising and joining Representative Corman as he leads us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, so this morning we're here to have one public hearing scheduled for 9 a.m. A public hearing on HB 556-FN relative to the duties of the Information Technology Council. And as soon as we complete that public hearing, we will move on to an executive session in which we will hear or adjudicate 11 bills, 11 or 12, I've forgotten, 11 or 12 bills uh, that are listed in the House calendar. So with that, I will open the public hearing on House Bill 556 and call to the front of the room the prime sponsor of the bill, Representative Eric Gallagher of Concord. Welcome, Representative. So, hello, uh, for the record, I am Representative Eric Gallagher uh, from Concord Ward 6, that's Merrimack County District 20, and I am here to introduce House Bill 556 relative to the duties of the Information Technology Council. So, this bill is, was part of um, one of the bills I filed last year. Um, so last year I filed uh, House Bill 1273, which I also referred to as my Software Act, which was um, an acronym for securing our freedom to write and read everything. Um, so yeah, this bill is based on um, feedback I got from that bill. So um, yeah, basically the idea of it is to promote software freedom in the state of New Hampshire. That is being able to do with your computers as you wish rather than having um, big tech companies control you. Um, so the feedback um, part, one of the items of feedback was that I was trying to do too much in a single bill. Um, this it went before EDNA, by the way. Um, so this is their feedback. Um, so yeah, I split it up. This was the part of the bill that was the um, study committee portion of it, basically just studying how we can um, 
make greater use of free software that is free instant freedom at, um, here in the state. Um, another part of the f feedback was, all right, why is this coming before EGNA instead of science and technology? And I mean, I, I don't really know how get bills got assigned, but um, this year by breaking it into multiple pieces, I did manage to get at least this one before this committee. So um, hopefully that's an improvement. Um, and then another one was, why are you creating a new study committee when we already have this information technology council? Um, so yeah, I took basically the duties of the previous bills study committee and um, just assigned them to the existing uh, information technology uh, council instead. So um, to go over the, um, so to go over the uh, bullet points, um, so replacing proprietary software used by state agencies, proprietary software is basically the opposite of free and open source software. Um, it basically gives tech companies leverage over us. Um, and I, there, there is bipartisan anger at big tech um, from the right for things like censorship and from the left for just being big in general. Um, so, yeah, I think that if we can figure out a way to reduce or remove entirely our use of proprietary software, we can um, gain some power back from the big tech companies. Um, so then also um, there's a point about artificial intelligence in there. Um, that's something that's becoming a hot topic that I think as a state we need to start thinking about. Um, so copyleft licensees, um, that's a specific type of free and open source software, um, bit, um, which basically it's a form of copyright, but instead of granting exclusive rights um, like proprietary software does, it requires uh, people that use and redistribute copyleft software to preserve those same freedoms um, to in any further redistributions. Um, so state's ability to develop and release open source software, that means writing software itself as opposed to the previous one where it's about using other people's free and open source software. Um, consider how to develop a program and funding mechanism for providing legal assistance to developers of free software. That, um, that has to do with um, one of the, uh, one complaint I hear from free software developers a lot as to uh, why they don't use copyleft licenses as well. Oh, it's gonna be too much of an effort for me to defend it in court. Um, so I think um, having ma making it easier for free software developers to do that would help encourage the development of more of it. Um, so review and develop recommendations for the expansion of the statewide information policy on open government data standards. So that's basically just like what file formats things are in. Um, and then adapt, enact, adopt, and implement when feasible a policy to ensure the right to data portability. So that's one of the things Europe's GDPR um, addressed the P in that is for portability. Uh, basically, um, being able to take your computing data from one service to another rather than um, having the company that runs the service control whether you can do that or not. So um, that one, that's what that one's about. So 
this is all um, this is all advisory. Um, the the uh, it, advice is can certainly be ignored if the information technology ends up giving bad advice. Um, so yeah, I think that makes it a pretty good substitute for a study committee and um, I'll take any questions now. Thank you. Before I uh, call on Representative Thomas to ask a question, I need to ask a question myself. And that is when you use the word free in this legislation, you mean free to inspect uh, and transparent, but you don't necessarily mean free of cost. Is that correct? Uh, yes, correct. Um, in the free software world, um, sometimes that's referred to as the libre versus gratis distinction, um, j just due to other languages have that distinction, um, where libre means free as in freedom, um, and then gratis means free as in cost. Uh, sometimes you have software that is both Libre and gratis, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. There are actually some companies that sell Libre software, like Red Hat, for instance. Um, and meanwhile, there's also lots of gratis software that is not Libre. So yeah, I mean, um, I, I mean primarily uh, Libre software. Thank you for that clarification. Representative Thomas has a question. That's Doug Thomas, that is. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. Um, uh, comment first, uh, uh, it's interesting that this came to us. I was going to recommend that it go to Commerce uh, for our review. But <laughs> that's since, the one since, committee. Since we have it here. <laughs> that, that's the one committee that I haven't got. Well, actually, they got right to repair, which wasn't originally part of this bill, but is kind of related, but they're the one committee that, yeah, the um, last year's bill got broken up, so it went to eDNA, Judiciary, Criminal Justice, and this committee, but not Commerce, though. So, so my, my, my question is, um, since we already have Information Technology Council, I, I don't see why, Ex explain to me why these items could not have just been presented to the council in a matter of an agenda item instead of having a whole new bill and repurposing the uh, the uh, the IT council. Why, why couldn't these things be discussed in the council just as a, a part of a normal agenda item? I mean, I guess theoretically they could be, but if you look at the RSA being amended here, it has a bunch of other items on there already that could also just be agenda items. Um, about strategic technology plans, uh, computer so systems consolidation. Uh, so I think basically this is just meant to um, fit in with the existing items and provide a bit more direction. Follow up. Uh, do you, with these, if these things were added. Would there be would there be need for additional people to be placed on the council for expanded knowledge purposes? Um, the the legislation does not specify a number of or well at least the RSA being amended here does not specify the number of members. So um, I mean, yeah, I'm not touching that. So I would assume that it would continue to work the way it currently does. Representative Corman has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Representative Gallagher, for taking my question. Can you provide us some examples of some of the state systems that would be appropriate to transition from proprietary to free or open source? Um. So, yeah, uh, I mean, I think like using LibreOffice instead of Microsoft Office, for example, would be one. Um, for uh, GIS, um, I know like my, my dad makes maps for the state um, and um, apparently uh, 
the planning office pays out a lot of money to um, Esri every year when um, previously it did actually use Grass GIS, which is a free alternative to it, um, which I think could be returned to. Um, uh, some of my other bills focused more on user-facing ones, such as um, su such as like the websites or things that people inter inter uh, citizens interact with um, for like paying taxes or filing for um, assistance programs with uh, with DHHS, for example, um, and. There, there have been stories. Um, one, one of our local town or town libraries actually transitioned their entire library software to be free and open source. Um, and so, I mean, we have a state library, so I, I think they could take some inspiration from the town that did that. I can't remember which one it was off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of examples, and there are in fact a lot of places where um, the state does already use free and open source software. Like at one of the previous hearings, um, the commissioner was telling about how a lot of the websites run on Drupal. So um, that is something that's good that I think could be done more of. Um, Representative Berezny um, had a bill that I co-sponsored last term that was also kind of along these lines. Um, so yeah, um, I think this bill could um, help identify some additional ways to follow up on that. Representative Wendy Thomas has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative, for being here. Um, this is um, very interesting ideas in this bill. And I believe um, you're the first one to bring up the ethics of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Um, <clears throat> my concern, and this sort of piggybacks on what um, Representative Doug Thomas said, was um, do you believe the council, you're requiring some pretty um, intense new studies to be added to this report. Um, and I don't know if it's a yearly report or not, but do you believe the council has the skills and the resources to add on all of these more complex studies? Um, I mean, yeah, fear, well, so my original idea was to make a new study committee because EDNA was wondering why make a new study committee when the Information Technology Council already exists. Um, if it turns out that we do actually need an entirely new study committee, then yeah, I'd be fine with switching back to that with making it a separate committee after all. I was just um, handing this to the Information Technology Council specifically based on feedback from EDNA last term. Thank you. Representative Summers has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for taking my question. Now, myself being a former paid hacker, I have to ask you a question about open source. Um, knowing that uh, in open source and freeware, it's pretty common that we used to, back in the days of bash OpenBSD, and that we used to live in that world. And we'd be able to, would this not make it easier for folks to be able to manipulate the kernel, change the, uh, change the clock speed, and be able to manipulate software that's open to everybody? Um. So, well, it, it depends on the people you're talking about specifically. Um, yes, it would make it easier for people in the state government who we want to actually be doing that. But free software, it does come with access controls and security features. Um, you know, being open source uh, lets it be inspected by a large number of people to, um, so that means that it, uh, vulnerabilities are disclosed more quickly. Um, in previous hearings, uh, for example, the log4j vulnerability was brought up, which was kind of portrayed as uh, a failing of 
open source, but I actually see that as a success of open source since the vulnerability was actually disclosed rather than just going undisclosed for a long period of time where nobody knows if it's being exploited or not, whereas this actually let it get fixed a lot quicker um, si since, uh, yeah, just a, um, a random person who knows it was able to fix it. Um, so, and yeah, I'd also remind people of the distinction between code and data. Um, so, yeah, so uh, software that is open source can be used with data that is private. Um, there, there is a distinction there. Um, and yeah, you see, you know, there's examples like the GNU Privacy Guard, for example, is an, um, a piece of software that can help protect your privacy. Uh, data privacy. So, um, but yeah, that is something that this uh, council could look at. Representative Cretion has a question. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Um, also wanted to say thank you for bringing this bill. It's nice to actually deal with some technology um, on the st &E committee. Um, I was just wondering, getting to the um, ethics of artificial intelligence usage, um, can you give some examples of places where state agencies maybe are looking at using AI or are already using AI? Do you know if anyone's using like chat GPT to create things, et cetera? Um, so no, I don't know if they are currently, but there are lots of applications where, um, where they could be. Um, yeah, like ChatGPT, I use that to um, help prepare for uh, some of my, I, I asked it about some of my own bills that I was introducing to see uh, what it thought of them. Not, not this one specifically, but other ones. Um, yeah, um, stuff like stable diffusion or doll E for artwork generation, um, you know, for if, if we need to modify our logo or provide graphics for, um, like there's a state office of graphics and printing that I walk by pretty often uh, on my walk to the LOB here. Um, uh, so yeah, like whether or not it would be, well, they're allowed to use that. Um, then also you get to stuff like uh, facial recognition um, in the criminal justice field, um, whether that should be allowed. Um, that's a form of AI. And then also AI-based uh, gunshot detections. And you see some police departments um, starting to use robots uh, for law enforcement. Um, so there's a question there as to like what sort of autonomy do we want to grant police robots that I think is worth going further into. Okay, seeing no further questions, I wanna thank you representative for introducing this uh, proposed legislation. And I'd uh, like you. now to call on Mr. Dennis Goulet, who is the commissioner of the Department of Information Technology. Mr. Goulet, welcome to st &E. Good morning, Mr. Chair, um, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dennis Goulet. Uh, as stated, I am the commissioner for the Department of Information Technology. As such, I'm responsible for um, operating the IT function for the executive branch uh, in New Hampshire, and I am a member on the IT council. The uh, uh, a, a small correction: uh, the the IT council um, membership is. Um, actually documented in statute 21R. And um, so we, we do change it from time to time, but I've been here almost eight years now. It's been pretty stable. Um, and it is a, a mixture of agency folks as well as outside influencers from education, city government, town government, county government. Uh, we, we operate um, in an attempt to um, guide the IT, I call it the board of directors for my department. And we like to have an idea that we're fully transparent and that we 
actually operate under best practice for the IT function for the executive branch. We also collaborate closely with the other branches of government, so you'll see a lot of times we're actually doing the same things. Um, I'm testifying in opposition to this bill this morning for three primary reasons. Uh, one is that um, actually the, the subparts um, IA9, IA10, and, and IF really are already covered under language in, in the Information Technology Council, and we can al already execute on things like that. In fact, we do consider, um, I I'll just give you an example, uh, Representative Gallagher brought it up. When we were talking some years ago about our new web what our new website platform should be for, for the state, um, we were looking at all kinds of options, and we ended up um, in, in deliberation with the Information Technology Council settling on an open source, a managed open source um, platform that we now use and are operating uh, most of our executive branch websites on, as well as the uh, judicial branch website and the Secretary of State. Uh, super cost effective, works really well for us. So, you know, we do already consider open source and we're running it in, in various other places. In fact, the most recent thing is, is um, for our small agencies, we have, they have a, a real challenge with costs, right? They don't have a lot of money. A lot of times they're general funded. So we're trying to make sure we're spending the least amount of money for them. And and we're going to do a pilot on, a, on an, an open source um, case management platform to see if that would be a good fit for the small agencies. Uh, the second reason why, why uh, area of concern is the council's really not uh, currently um, empowered or provisioned to take on some of these new duties um, as defined in subparts uh, I, IB through E and IG. Um, it, it, this would really reinvent our focus and, and shift us outside of our you know, best practice for the executive branch IT function. And finally, proposed subparts IC, ID, and IE um, really appear to take and direct the council to a specific policy position, which I believe is outside of our peer review and may actually not, um, not be uh, guide us towards best practice in each case. Uh, so best practice evolves over time, putting detailed uh, IT policy positions in statute that then myself and my successors have to follow, I don't think is in the best interest of the executive branch or even the, the state as a whole. Uh, a couple other questions came up, uh, or at least one other, and that was um, the, the uh, are there examples where it, it might be good to run open source software for the state? And I, I think I touched on that a little bit, but um, you know, we, we do have, um, you know, we are running, um, our primary server operating system is Linux. Um, we run a managed Linux so that we're watching out for um, you know, making sure we're fully patched at all times. We have over a thousand Linux servers running applications just for the executive branch. And um, you know, just the, the, uh, the, the effort of making sure we're uh, patching them for security and, and privacy of information is, is a large effort, but it does run really well for us. So I, again, uh, I would, uh, uh, again, example of how we're, we are using open source and we are considering it when, uh, when appropriate. Uh, the log4j came up. I thought um, I, I appreciate the question related to security. I think that any you know, open source or proprietary software can be managed in a secure way or in an insecure way. I don't know that either one of those platforms is particularly less secure than the other. It's all about how you manage the code base and manage the installed base. The log4j example that some incorrect information was shared, um, and that is that that vulnerability was out there for a long time, years and years and years. And and it's taking us actually years to remediate it because it managed to get its, that, that library managed to get into lots of platforms, both both open source and proprietary platforms. So to, the, to this day, I'm still, you know, years after that popped, I'm still still managing it. The final thing is, uh, and before I take as many questions as you have, is around artificial intelligence. It, it is rearing its head now, and I think that, you know, 
I'd like to, to contrast between what I think the IT Council's duty is as it relates to artificial intelligence and, and, and general public policy duty. So is artificial intelligence a good way to run IT in New Hampshire from an IT perspective? That is absolutely the IT Council's responsibility. And I think we should look at it and say what we're doing and say whether we think it's a good thing or not. Then there's, is, uh, is um, AI or ro robotic process automation uh, a good thing for the state, the citizens of the state, the citizens of our country? That is not the purview of the Information Technology Council. That's a larger public policy issue that should be taken up elsewhere. Uh, we do have some examples we're considering now, and we're considering a re remote process automation pilot soon. Um, why are we doing that? We're having a hard time hiring people, and there's certain types of jobs that it's really good for. Is that, is that the right thing to do? I'm not, I'm not making that distinction. I'm, I'm saying we may have areas where we can mitigate the fact that we can't hire people using RPI. That concludes my formal testimony, and I have, uh, I'll take questions. Excellent. Thank you for that uh, testimony. Representative Doug Thomas has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question. And um, it's good to see you here again. You don't come here very often, so it's good to see you. No, once in a while. <laughs> um, so this poses a kind of a good question here. Uh, if, the, if there's a distinction between the Information Technology Council and the Information Technology Department, uh, my question would be on what you see in this bill, which all seem to be good ideas of things that should be considered, who if if not you or the council, who who do you believe should be looking at these things at at the state level? You know, I didn't prepare for that question, so you you got me <laughs> you got me on that one. I I I'd be happy to cogitate on that and look at each one individually and give you a, a written answer. Uh, okay. That that I think that would be more appropriate since I didn't spend any time thinking about it. Uh, thank you. It it would be good. Thank you. Representative McWilliams has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for testifying in front of us this morning. I am intrigued by the possibility of AI uh, in terms of possibly helping out where we don't have the staffing and also um, you know, setting some guardrails for future use of AI by the state. Uh, how do you see that being reviewed and considered and how do you see that playing out in the next five years? Well, um, it's, you know, with the, with the uh, massive acceleration of public understanding that the AI functions, the chat GPT was brought up earlier. Um, we're, we're now, um, that's gonna be an agenda item on our next IT council meeting. And we're gonna be talking about what we know and what we don't know, but it's a national policy issue. My peers, there's a, a body called the National Association of State Chief Information Officers. And I will tell you that we're, we are caught a little flat footed at the moment with the, the massive acceleration from that perspective. But um, we've already been using AI in other areas. Uh, uh, states and, and New Hampshire did this, where we, you know, taking you know your traditional FAQ and creating a smart chat bot that that then adapt that you adapt over time so that it actually gives better answers. Um, we're I, I, we're honestly not very good at that because it requires. It's not just technology. It's like um, when social media first came out and business entities or public policy entities wanted to start engaging in social media, they said, oh, we'll just put, put something up there and let it go, and you can't do that. So AI, you know, whether it's a chat bot or, or ro robotic process automation, needs people watching it. You can't just put it out there and let it run. Couple reasons. One is, you know, you can keep making it better with little tweaks. You can watch some of them. Some of it's very well instrumented, and you can keep an eye on it and make it better. And and that's our job, isn't it? You know, if we're trying to serve the citizens, we want to focus on what we're doing and try to make it better. The other thing is, you can have some real unintended consequences, which you're not going to find out quickly enough if you're not paying attention. Um, so we will be bringing that up at our next IT council meeting. We will be piloting some RPI in, in, uh, for those uh, folks who are, um, we have some you know, innovative folks in the state that want to try it out to help solve their problems, and we'll, we'll do some piloting of that uh, very soon, actually. Representative Brezhne has a question. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. 
if I heard correctly, when you listed the things that you don't think um, are or should be the duty of the council, um, you said B through E and then um, G, but I think you you didn't say F. Is do, do you think that F is okay for? Um, well, well, I Actually, um, F is already, I feel F is already um, covered under the duties of the council. Okay. And then I have a follow-up question. Yes, follow-up. Um, so uh, for number uh, nine under A, uh, is there, w would you be acceptable to changing this um, to something else that's similar but more acceptable? Or, or do you have feedback, more feedback on number nine there? Uh, nine being the potential cost and feasibility of replacing all proprietary software Is okay you're referring to that yes yeah okay so I did a I did model um, house bill 617 I think it is I did do a cost model for that um, it's very you know the the one of the challenges with with proprietary uh, proprietary software versus open source software in the government space is th th there isn't a large market for what we do so there isn't um, a huge huge companies doing these functions like driver license system, things like that. So what we'd end up doing in, in that case, if we said, all right, we're going to do everything or as much as possible with open source, I'd, I'd have a massive development team. You know, so w when considering that, I thought, okay, well, if, if we're going to do everything open source, we have to do it in a way that's secure and private and also federally compliant, which is a huge deal because we accept a lot of federal funds and we get audited on that. And there's certain there's requirements for software lifecycle maintenance and, and things like that. So we could absolutely do it. Uh, it'd be very expensive because I'd be developing, and, and, and the time to value would be much slower in, in many cases because if, if there's software out there that can do something, like I know I can go out today and buy permitting software that's 85% of the way ready for me to use in, in serving our citizens and businesses in the state. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have the ability to do that in an open source context and I'd have to have a development team build that for us. Um, so, uh, I think we already do a lot of this. We look at, all right, when we go out to procure, we don't say, I'm going to buy open source software or I'm going to buy proprietary software. We procure what solves our business problem in the most cost effective way, which I think is the appropriate way to look at technology. Technology is not, it, it's not an end in itself. The business priorities that are our citizen service business priorities are the end. That's how we should define our, our mission. That's how we should procure technology. Representative Parshall has a question. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for coming today. Um, this is more of a general question. Um, in light of how our other state agencies are sometimes managed. How well can you uh, investigate such things as AI and other innovations without any type of legislative directive? Um, well, we all of the contracts in the executive branch um, come before me for approval. So I, I, actually, I know what's going on. I know what we're acquiring. We have uh, IT, DOIT staff, roughly half of my staff, um, which is 370 authorized positions, is sitting inside agencies, working directly with the agencies. So we actually know what's going on in the agencies. We work very closely with them, um, it, it, that team who's embedded. And we also talk to each other. We have regular me weekly meetings where all of the heads of IT for each agency get together and speak. Uh, so I, I feel like um, if, if in, in, in the AI stuff was was... Uh, done at, at my initiation. So uh, what I said is, okay, let's, how do we innovate here? And what agency needs it the most and is, is um, psychologically oriented to trying out new things? So, so I feel like we're in, in decent shape there. There's a lot of challenges we do have. That's not one of our biggest ones, though. Follow up? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so I gather now that your, much of your work is being driven from the base up. And I think it's laudable. Um, still, I will ask again to take a look at innovative uh, aspects that are not quite part of what is being driven from the bottom, such things as AI and chat, uh, GDP, whatever it is. 
Um, things like this. Uh, are you, do you feel like you're permitted to take initiative to investigate these areas, or do you need legislation to direct you and to investigate these more? Oh, I, I understand your question better now. I apologize for not answering it the first time. Uh, I feel like we have uh, it, it, uh, the um, 21 R uh, as, as exists today empowers us to do that, and we do that all the time. And sometimes the, you know, the innovation comes from us thinking about it in DOIT. Other times it comes from the agencies who, who, who through their own research have found something interesting that they, that they want to try. Before I call on Representative Munns for a question, I want to uh, let everyone who is observing this meeting know that an executive session will begin at the conclusion of this public hearing. Representative Munns has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, for taking my question. Um, are you aware of any states that have adopted what this bill is recommending going with op all, all uh, op uh, free software? Uh, no. In fact, I, I spent almost two years as the president of the National Association of Chief Information Officers, so I'm pretty familiar with what's going on around the country. In addition to the fact that I've been, you know, I've been doing this for eight years, which turns out to be a long time in my business. I'm the third most tenured state CIO, and I have not seen this done anywhere. Thank you. Representative Corman has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question. If systems were to transition from proprietary software produced by companies that are actually trying to make money and keep users happy to free and open source, are you concerned about support issues? Uh, you know, if there's a question that, that somebody in state government has, who are they going to call? Yes. Um, in fact, the, the, the maintenance and support um, for, if, you know, for, free and open source. It's one of the reasons why, for example, our websites, even they're running on Drupal, but they're not managed by us. I have a, a third party company who manages that instance, make sure they're patching it, make sure they're keeping it up to date. What, what we see in other states, and we had a question about what other states are doing. The, uh, other states, uh, a lot of them are using open source for their website platforms. And the number one reason uh, for website, state website defacement is the fact that it, they put it out there and forget about it and then don't patch it because they don't have the staff to do so. So one of the things you, you have to look at is, is, and it goes back to my statement earlier about any software can be run securely or not, depending on how, how well you manage it. So I, I believe that, you know, for example, we, we run um, our learning management system is open source and it works really well in some cases, but I have to stay very focused on managing that, and I have staff who does that, um, which is not necessarily typical. If I were, you know, for, if I have a, uh, you know, a managed um, proprietary or managed open source scenario. So in the case of the learning management system, we own it. We own patching it. We own keeping it updated. We own, con you know, configuring it, things like that. So it is definitely more of a burden uh, in that respect. And I'll go a little further and say support model is something we think really hard about for each and every technology we acquire. So it's not about buying the, the software or the technology per se. That's the smallest part of the cost. The, the largest part of the cost is implementing and managing over time in an effective way. So when we're looking at, when I'm looking at a, a, a procurement that's coming across my desk and whether I should sign off on it for technology, I'm looking at, has the support model been thought through? Are we going to have, make sure that we're securing the data for our citizens? Uh, things like that. So we actually do have our, our chief information security officer reviews every single contract. And we kick it back if we're not satisfied with how that, how the, 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 it's going to be managed and how the data is going to be protected. Representative Cretion has a question. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Um, Unfortunately, I guess I wasn't paying as close attention as Representative Brezhny, but you did mention um, that there are a few elements in this bill that you feel like you're already covering um, on the IT Council. Um, I guess in your perspective, would there be harm in adding it to statute to ensure that that was clear that that's part of the Council's responsibility? Um, or would that restrict you in some way? 
I, I don't think it's necessary. It's already, I think the, 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 um, the verbiage as it exists or the uh, language as it exists already um, empowers that and, and, and requires it, so. Seeing no further questions, I want to thank you for being here to uh, give us your perspective on this proposed legislation. Thank you for the opportunity. I do have one, actually, I do have one other question. <laughs> The Department of uh, the Legislative Budget Assistant was charged with producing the fiscal note for this bill, and they consulted you, and there was no time to produce one. Have you provided an updated fiscal note to the House Clerk? Yeah, I did. Um, uh, I think it was a couple weeks ago. We we finished it initially. The the process went. We I, I was asked for a fiscal note. I sent one in. They questioned the the um, some of my assumptions, which I then clarified, and um, so there. I did see in language that, that my fiscal note in information is in the current language that's on the website right now. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So next I'll call on our final uh, presenter for this bill, Dennis Goddard of Hopkinton, representing himself. Welcome to st and &E, Mr. Goddard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dennis Goddard, and I'm here, of course, um, purely representing my own personal opinions um, on the legislation, but it's relevant um, for you to know um, the, these opinions are sort of informed by um, my position as a director of development and operations at Oracle Corporation, uh, the world's largest database company. Specifically, I'm employed in the autonomous database division, which is that division which is charged with figuring out ways to more uh, usefully uh, marry artificial intelligence and large database technology. Um, so I think at the end of the day, and I'm in support of this legislation, all of the issues listed here are issues that just we as a society, as a civilization, are going to have to deal with, are presently dealing with, and desperately need our public institutions to be looking at. And some of these are hard. Are, and I've been in a number of companies and organizations that have had to deal with some of these specific enumerated issues. How are we going to deal with open source? This was a huge problem for us proprietary companies, especially about 20 years ago when it got fashionable for some of us employed in large companies to start coding free stuff on our free time. Um, because these things are difficult as a society to talk about, I think it's going to be necessary because it's easy for organizations not to deal with difficult, complex, challenging intellectual problems. Um, I think these specific things do need to be enumerated, and there needs to be some accountability, and we need the public institutions in particular, um, the Information Technology Council. Um, to be looking at these issues and, and give us the public um, some some clarity and some information back. Um, it's not clear to me, as, as a non-expert in our state um, government, whether the information technology is the group that needs to look at these issues, but it is absolutely a group that needs to look at these issues. Um, I want to speak uh, very. Oh, and uh, I want to speak very briefly to uh, a couple of points made by the commissioner. I, I sort of heard two things. Um, both, on the one hand, there are things that we already do, and on the other hand, things that we ought not to look at. Um, I would say that those things that are already being looked at, that is great. That is very, very good. Um, and we need to depend on more than oral tradition and institutional knowledge to keep that up. We need that clarified, and we need some accountability that we as the public are going to get some, some clarity on certain of these things. Uh, and know for sure um, that the council is, is examining these issues. Um, as for the things that it's asserted that possibly we ought not to do, these are very large things. I, you know, Okay, so real briefly, a little bit more about my personal life. I was doing AI before it was cool. Um, back in 1992, you can look this up, um, I 
trained a neural network using Intel 486s, which was the best that we had at the time. He had a bank of them back at the university, right? Um, it was UW Madison. I could train it to do like letter recognition, like you could draw letters, not my neural network could, could recognize those. Um, but it's really, and, and so when this sort of artificial intelligence discussion, just a couple of years ago, uh, Stephen Hawking, before he died, suddenly came out and said, you know, AI is the biggest threat to humanity or something like that. And I just thought, how overblown this guy's, you know, past his peak. Um, but in the last two or three years, um, I've come to realize that perhaps, um, well, it, it's been said, and I, I no longer think this is exaggeration, that artificial intelligence poses more of a change to our society than the internet did, possibly more than electricity. It is necessary for our public institutions to be examining not just that, but e even in a more um, immediate sense, open source. And the, the two things are ethically related. And we need individual uh, public bodies, particularly a technology council, to be looking at them. Uh, I, I, so very, very briefly, I'm, um, I just want to mention that um, support has been mentioned. Um, again, largest database company in the world. So many of our customers run their databases on Linux. Um, the majority of our developers do their work on Linux. Um, and not just Oracle, IBM, uh, Red Hat, lots and lots of really big companies will be very happy to sell you or any other uh, government uh, contracts for support and development. Uh, including of open source stuff, uh, though I can't speak, I, I'm not a salesman for, for my company. Um, oh, and I, I do have to apologize. I, I, I have to take a little bit of umbrage. I heard it mentioned by a member, um, something about the old days and bash. I, I do spend the majority of my waking and working life in the Bash shell, and it's a beautiful place to live, and I will live there as long as I can. Um, thank you. Okay, questions for Mr. Goddard. Very interesting point of view. I appreciate you being here to uh, offer it to us. One question from Representative Bereshny. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. Um, so you mentioned several times that you think that we should be talking about these issues. Um, it's a little hard to say just talking about them without having sort of an end product or, or kind of a conclusion that we should reach. Can you elaborate on what you think, like if, if there was a com committee or commission that had the end result, what would those bullet points be? Thank you. Oh, I, I believe that they're explicitly laid out uh, in both the bill and the existing legislation. We're looking for direction and advice, like advise the commissioner on what are we doing about copyleft? what are the ethics as the council sees them on the use of artificial intelligence, where and how, and how is it applicable? Um, that, that doesn't necessarily mean creating law or a, or a policy, but it, it does mean, uh, well, but perhaps a policy, uh, advice to the commissioner. Um, advice perhaps back to the legislative body. Certainly I would see a council as being a better tool for some of these fast moving things than if we don't do this in the format of, of a council that can act in a more um, expeditious manner, we're going to have to be dealing with these things reactively each and individually in kind of legislation in response to what do we do when we find that people using jet GPT have <laughs> Lord knows done what to our to our democratic processes, our consensus on what's real. Um, you know, the, the, these are areas where um, I believe they are, our commissioner and our, our legislators uh, and our executive uh, require uh, some, some unified um, uh, message back, just as they presently are, on, on things like how are we going to use information technology generally? How do we consolidate our systems generally? Which are already in the legislature, already in you know, past legislation. Thank you. Representative Corman has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here and, and for taking my question. When I think about AI in state agencies or in general, one of the concerns that comes up is bias. And bias can come certainly from training data, but can also be reinforced by the software itself. And I'm just wondering, what, what are your thoughts on 
where, the, what, what are the sources of bias and what can be done about it? My thoughts are that we are in the stone age when it comes to AI. Um, I do talk to um, academics and individuals whose job it is to keep on the absolute cutting edge of AI, which at this point, as, a, as an amateur AI follower, I can't do anymore. It changes so much every six months. So much stuff is coming up. And as a, as a tech guy, that is saying something. Um, sorry, I almost lost a thread on that. Um, with respect to bias, so when, when I talk to these experts, the best things that we have that are come up with are things like, if you don't want it to know about pornography, don't show it pornography, and then it won't be able to generate pornography. And that's the best that we can do, really? And that, yeah, is the best that we can do right now. Really, these are largely what they call black boxes. They're, um, there is a, a burgeoning science of explainable AI, uh, but that's very limited, and most of what a AI stuff is actually out there is, you know, we trained it, we don't really understand exactly how it works, how it comes up with certain biases. A fascinating topic is hacking AI, where you, classical example, a clear and obvious picture of, say, a dog, you ask the thing, is this a cat or a dog, uh, or, or what, is the, what is this object, it comes up with the dog, by altering a few pixels in a way that a human would never notice. You can push the thing because it's in a very high dimensional space, two points that don't appear to be close together in a higher dimension can be. Boom, the thing, oh, it's a fire hydrant, absolutely guaranteed fire hydrant, 99% accuracy fire hydrant, right? Um, so where these bias, and that's, that's a kind of bias, right? Where these biases come from, how to manipulate them, we're only in the stone age of being able to figure out how it happens. Um, anyone that tells you otherwise is selling you something. Representative Munns has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, th thank you for testifying. This has been fascinating, and you've certainly opened my mind. Um, are, there other, are there other issues that we should be addressing that aren't included in this bill that we should include? Probably, and too numerous to mention, and appearing too fast to absorb as a society, I would view this bill as an, a very important, I think we have consensus. Um, generally, um, about these particular things being things that, in general, are in the zeitgeist. We know that open source is a thing. We know that copyrights and how large tech companies interface with individuals and our data um, and how AI is going to play into all of this ethically. I think this is a good base to start from. Okay, seeing no other questions, I thank you for being here today to give us your perspective on this proposed legislation. And with no more pink cards in hand, I will close the public hearing on House Bill 556. And do we have any blue sheet information? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, House Bill 556, the blue sheet, none in support, one oppose, Online, three in support, none opposed, one neutral. Thank you. Okay, thank you. It is now time to move to the second part of our activity for the day. And that is executive session. So we're going to start this morning by opening an executive session on House Bill 159 relative to the default service rate for electricity. And the chair recognizes Representative Doug Thomas for a motion. Well, actually, before I recognize Representative Doug Thomas, I'm gonna explain something that I had a discussion with the ranking member about earlier this morning. I was given information from the clerk about the process for coming up with an, a recommendation from the committee of without recommendation. As it turns out, the information I was given earlier about voting on all three possible states, OTP, ITL, and retain, is true, but only if the motions are made. So if a motion is made, 
and the resulting vote is 10-10, if no additional motions are made, then the bill comes out of committee without recommendation. So going through the process of voting for the other motions, which will both come out 10-10 anyway, doesn't have to be done. We can simply vote on one motion. If it comes out 10-10, restrain ourselves, discipline ourselves to make no further motions, and we're done. So with that explanation, I will now recognize Mr. Representative Mr. Chair. Doug Thomas for a Mr. motion on Mr. House Chair. Bill 159. Chair, I just have a question. Oh, okay. Question from Representative Munns. One of the things I've been struggling with over the weekend, and I probably should know this, but uh, humor me. Um, if we if we vote to retain the bill, does it go to the floor? No. Okay. That's what I Retain thought. means keep it within the committee. Okay. So that might be the only time, if we voted, if it was a 10-10 vote, we still might want to do a motion to retain because there may be some, some thoughts on whether it makes sense or not. Correct. Yeah, that thank, is correct. thank you. All right. Seeing no further questions, I'll recognize Representative Thomas for a motion on House Bill 159. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The motion uh, for HP 159 is to retain. Recognize Representative Bernardi. I second the motion. It's been moved and seconded that we retain House Bill 159. Representative Thomas is recognized. Uh, yes, uh, quite simply, there is a, a PC docket underway covering the subject, and uh, it would be best uh, to wait and see what comes out of that docket, and uh, then we can take it up later in the fall uh, on the retained uh, basis. Further discussion on the motion, Representative McWilliams. Thank you, Chair Vose. Um, this is a really important topic to our constituents in regards to peaks with electric bills, and I think that it would be worthy of a subcommittee. So I would be happy to serve on a subcommittee to look at this while it is being retained so we can bring it back with more information. Thank you, Representative Mc McWilliams. I think a subcommittee would be justified for this bill. Any further comment? Representative Corman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would you mind introducing the guests that we have on the committee today? Yes. So, Representative Larry Gagney is here today for Michael Harrington. Representative Charlie Melvin is here for Representative Lewicki and Carol Brown. And Representative Linda Ryan is here for Representative Kaplan. And Representative Rosemary Rung is here for Representative McGee. And I apologize for not doing that sooner. So now I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion of retain for House Bill 159. Doug Thomas. Yes. Janine Nodder. Yes. Larry Gagney. Yes. Troy Murner. Yes. Charlie Melvin. Yes. Lex Brezhny. Yes. J.D. Bernardi. Yes. Tom Plogé. Yes. James Summers. Yes. Rebecca McWilliams. Yes. Rosemarie Rung. Yes. Jackie Cretion. Yes. Lucius Parshall. Yes. Linda Ryan. Yes. Chris Munns. Yes. Henry Noel. Yes. Wendy Thomas. Yes. Thomas Corman. Yes. Ned Reynolds. Yes. Chairman Bose. Yes. 20 0. By a vote of 20 to nothing, the committee votes to retain House Bill 159. Representative McWilliams has volunteered to head a subcommittee on uh, this bill. Are there volunteers to join her on that subcommittee? Wendy Thomas. Douglas Thomas. How many do we need? Jackie Cretion. We need five. I have four. Representative Summers, could you be on this subcommittee? Yes. Who's, well, I already asked Representative Summers. He agreed. So that gives us five with uh, Representative McWilliams.
Now, to clarify, because we retain this bill, we can't address it until after the summer recess. So any subcommittee work will have to wait until I think it's mid-August or the 18th of August, something like that, before it could resume. So with that, we'll close the executive session on House Bill 159. Next, we'll open an exec session on House Bill 458 relative to participation in net energy metering by small hydroelectric generators. And I'll call on Representative Doug Thomas for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The motion on HB 458 is to retain. Representative Bernardi. Second the motion. It's been moved and seconded that we retain House Bill 458. Representative Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we've been made aware that there is a similar bill in the Senate coming. Uh, we feel it is a better version, so we like to wait and see uh, how it comes out, and so we can retain this for later, should, should need be. Thank you. In addition, um, one of the companies affected by this bill, White Mountain Paper, has asked us to retain this bill so that they can obtain a better understanding of its provisions. Representative Wendy Thomas. Thank you. Um, just a clarification question. If there's a similar bill that's better, why don't we just ITL this one? Or are you just hedging your bets here? Because we haven't seen the Senate version yet, and we want to make sure it's better before we let go of our own version. OK, thank you. Further comment, Representative Cretion. Just a clarifying question. Um, do you know the number of the Senate bill that is similar? I do not. Uh, but I know someone who does. Representative um, Mr. Cuzzy in the back of the room, please. Senate Bill 40. Okay, Senate Bill 40. Further comments on this motion to retain? Seeing none, I ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion to of retain for House Bill 458. Doug Thomas. Yes. Janine Nodder. Yes. Larry Gagney. Yes. Troy Murner. Yes. Charlie Melvin. Yes. Lex Brezhny. Yes. J.D. Bernardi. Yes. Tom Ploche. Yes. James Summers. Yes. Rebecca McWilliams. Yes. Rosemarie Rung. Yes. Jackie Cretion. Yes. Lucius Parshall. Yes. Linda Ryan. Yes. Chris Munns. Yes. Henry Noel. Yes. Wendy Thomas. Yes. Thomas Corman. Yes. Ned Reynolds. Yes. Chairman Vose. Yes. 20 0. By a vote of 20 to 0, House Bill 458 is retained in committee. I don't see any need for a subcommittee on this bill, so we'll just hold on to it till the fall and see what happens. With that, I'll close the exec session on House Bill 458 and open an exec session on House Bill 509, a bill relative to the phasing out of the minimum electric renewable portfolio standard and recognize Representative Doug Thomas for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On the motion for HB 509 is to retain. Represent, uh, Representative Bernardi. I second the motion. It's been moved and seconded that we retain House Bill 509, Representative Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, at the request of the sponsor, he wishes this bill retained. Uh, he feels there might be some work coming on down the line. So to honor his request, that's why we have the motion. Comment on the motion to retain House Bill 509. Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion of retain for House Bill 509 and remind members to turn off your microphone when you're not speaking. Doug Thomas. Yes. Janine Nodder. Yes. Larry Gagney. Yes. Troy Murner. Yes. Charlie Melvin. Yes. Lex Brezhny. Yes. J.D. Bernardi. Yes. Tom Ploge. Yes. James Summers. Yes. Rebecca McWilliams. Yes. Rosemary Rung. Yes. Jackie Cretion. No. Lucius Parshall. No. Linda Ryan. Yes. 
Chris Munns. Yes. Henry Noel. Yes. Wendy Thomas. No. Thomas Corman. No. Ned Reynolds. No. Chairman Vos. Yes. 15-5. By a vote of 16 to 5. 15. 15 to 5. The uh, committee votes to retain House Bill 509. Seeing no nece necessity for a subcommittee on this bill at the moment, we'll wait until the fall to decide if that's uh, going to be required. So with that, I'll close the executive session on House Bill 509. And I'll open an executive session on House Bill 81 and recognize Representative Thomas for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The motion for HB 81 is to retain. Representative Bernardi. I second the motion. Moved and seconded that we retain House Bill 81. Representative Thomas. Yes, uh, we had a, uh, actually, Mr. Chair, I have a point of order uh, on, on uh, for just the record. Uh, it just occurred to me before uh, that we had a subcommittee meeting. We had a very good discussion on uh, the fees and the subject matter of this bill, but we, we did not take an official vote on a subcommittee for a recommendation. So my question is, should we take a vote now so we can present it as a recommendation to the full committee? That's not necessary since you did not, the subcommittee did not make a recommendation. It comes to the full committee without recommendation. So it's up to the full committee to decide what to do. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Uh, so the, the rationale behind the retain is we, we heard from the, the um, main speaker, Amir Gass, that they were making several changes to um, address some of the issues that were addressed to us. Unfortunately, the, 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 the issues weren't very clear because we, we had stats on numbers of complaints where there were many, but we didn't have any uh, information as to, or the data as to, to the, the substance of, of these complaints, and not many went to the AG. So we feel that by retaining this bill, it will give us the opportunity to um, uh, analyze and observe the changes that one company is making to address their uh, the uh, concerns and it was also give us chance to um, investigate the other complaints and to put some substance behind them so that when we come back in the fall to discuss this we can make a, a better determination uh, this uh, places the onus on the uh, on that uh, particular company to fulfill their their uh, uh, promise it also it also gives us more time uh, to address some of the issues of the complaints to see what their nature was. That was, uh, that's the rationale behind re uh, retaining this bill. Thank you. Representative uh, Rosemary Rung has a comment. Yes, thank you very much, much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I was the prime sponsor of this bill, and the intent is to have a study committee. So I think the intent of retain is to study it more, but that's also the intent of the bill is to study this issue more. And I was hoping that um, it, it would broaden the people that would be looking at this beyond this one committee. Um, I think a study committee, if, this, if the retain was to fail and we went to OTP, the study committee could then comprise not only members of this committee, but also members of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. Because I believe some of the practices that were brought up uh, really fall under their purview. We could also bring in through a study committee um, members from the Attorney General's office who've received some of these complaints and consumer advocates. So the intent of retain and passing this bill is the same. It is to study the issue. My concern with leaving it up to the industry to solve these problems first is, is a, a fool's game because um, the, the major company that is bringing these issues um, has an F rating by the Better Business Bureau. It's on its second lawsuit with the state of Michigan and has civil lawsuits from Florida all the way to Wyoming. Um, I don't believe they've established the credibility to be able to address their problems honestly. So therefore, um, I'm going to vote against retain and hope that a motion of ought to pass would, would then follow. Thank you. 
Thank you. Representative Bernardi has a comment. Yes, as a member of the subcommittee, uh, we also had considerable discussion with the, uh, the gas association uh, that deals with all the companies in New Hampshire, and we got a commitment from them to move forward on harmonizing some uh, uh, communications, and uh, I, I think it's very important that you know, we get that feedback from them on how they are going to operate. Further comment on this uh, motion to retain? Representative Wendy Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A clarification question of the subcommittee. Um, did you find issues with any other company other than Amerigas? Um, there was a sheet passed out with a number of complaints from various uh, gas companies in the state, and uh, the Amerigas was... Uh, by at least two, almost two to one, uh, more complaints than the next company, which was uh, Eastern, which had a sizable number of complaints as well. Um, but again, they were numbers, and no one was able to ascertain if it was just a complaint about billing, if it was a misunderstanding about a delivery day was coming. Uh, we did hear one or two examples of uh, issues with removing tanks uh, when you're changing companies, but there was nothing uh, substantial with risk those numbers. That's why we, we have a, in fact, I believe the, the uh, study committee uh, asked a question, uh, at, the, at the present time I forget who it was, but to go all forth and try and find out what those complaints subsisted of. Um, and I will say that uh, if anyone was aware of the uh, retain bill that we had last year, I think uh, Representative Partial was part of the committee. We, we as a retain as a retain bill, I will be holding uh, meetings to make sure that we get down to the bottom of, of what's going on here. This is not a this is not a brush off. We will be looking at this. Thank you, Representative Partial has a comment. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I was also part of that committee, and I think that's uh, accurate uh, how Doug represented. We, uh, by and far, the business practices of one company dominate these, uh, dominate our hearings. For the most part, the small, what we call the mom and pop gas companies, they seem to be rather responsive to the to the uh, customers in their town, and they're well seated there. I don't really perceive much of a difficulty with them, but I am extremely concerned with one player. And I really do think that a study committee could give us the ability to examine the, how current these are and what the options are and would put the right people in place, not just people from our committee here, but um, people, f uh, legislators from uh, consumer, um, <laughs> yes, Commerce, thank you, commerce, in order to uh, better serve uh, the end goal. Um, and so that's why I'm going to be voting against um, retain and for OTP should have come up. Representative Munns has a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I also will be uh, voting against retain for many of the reasons that Representative Rung um, spelled out. Um, I do think one of the significant differences between a subcommittee and a study committee is that the study committee is required to submit a formal report of its findings and recommendations. And my hope would be that um, that report could be a good roadmap for the industry to follow and hopefully implement on their own. Um, and, um, you know, it, it would also provide a, a, a sense of whether there's any additional legislation that's required. So it feels more, much more uh, proactive and action oriented than um, just a, um, a subcommittee looking into whether we should in fact have a study committee. Thank you. I would comment on Representative Munn's comment by pointing out that the that retain and a study committee would have roughly the same deadline to produce results, and it might take longer to organize and get moving a study committee, whereas this committee, if we retain the bill, could move more quickly. 
to get to a resolution in time for a November 1st or December 1st deadline. So retain and a study committee would have the same deadline, but retain might get us to the end result more quickly. Further comments on the motion to retain? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion of retain for House Bill 81. Doug Thomas. Yes. Janine Nodder. Yes. Larry Gagney. Yes. Troy Murner. Yes. Charlie Melvin. Yes. Lex Brezhny. Yes. Jade Bernardi. Yes. Tom Plage. Yes. James Summers. Yes. Rebecca McWilliams. No. Rosemary Rung. No. Jackie Cretion. No. Lucius Parshall. No. Linda Ryan. No. Chris Munns. No. Henry Noel. No. Wendy Thomas. No. Thomas Corman. No. Ned Reynolds. No. Chairman Vos. Yes. 10-10. By a vote of 10 to 10, the motion to retain fails. Chair recognizes Representative Doug Thomas for a motion. Anticipating this, my motion, I make the motion to OTP. Representative Bernardi. I second the motion. It's been moved and seconded that we OTP House Bill 81. Any further comment? Representative Summers. Just a quick one on the subcommittee. Although I made the recommendation subcommittee for retain, I want to make sure that they actually, that the company that's involved actually can move forward. So I agree with ought to pass as well. Further comment on the motion of ought to pass on House Bill 81. Representative Parshall. Yes, uh, we recognize that justice delayed is justice denied. And I want to make sure that we get to the bottom of this $20 service fee that one of our members is being charged. The quicker, the better. Thank you. Additional comment? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the question of ought to pass on House Bill 81. Doug Thomas. Yes. Janine Nodder. No. Larry Gagney. Yes. Troy Murner. Yes. Charlie Melvin. Yes. Lex Brezhny. Yes. J.D. Bernardi. Yes. Tom Plage. Yes. James Summers. Yes. Rebecca McWilliams. Yes. Rosemary Rung. Yes. Jackie Cretion. Yes. Lucius Parshall. Yes. Linda Ryan. Yes. Chris Munns. Yes. Henry Noel. Yes. Wendy Thomas. Yes. Thomas Corman. Yes. Ned Reynolds. Yes. Chairman Vos. No, I think retained would be better. 18-2. By a vote of 18-2, to two, the motion of ought to pass is adopted for House Bill 81. Representative Thomas will write the committee report. Is there any need of a... Uh, of a my, minority report. That was Doug Thomas? That was Doug Thomas, oh, yes. Okay. Um, Representative McWilliams. Uh, just a question for the chair. Is this a potential bill for the consent calendar? <laughs> yes. Without objection, we'll put this on the consent calendar. Hearing no objections, it's so ordered. With that, we'll close the, the exec session on House Bill 81. Now move to an executive session for House Bill 558. And I recognize Representative Doug Thomas. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Recommendation for, for uh, HB 558, the motion is to retain. Representative Bernardi. I second the motion. It's been moved and seconded that we retain House Bill 558. Representative Thomas. Again, this is per sponsor request. Uh, to honor his request, uh, my motion is to retain. Any further comment necessary on the motion of retain for House Bill 558? Uh, just a, I don't have a sheet for it in here. I have to get one from the... Okay. Karen. Oh, no, I found it. It got buried. Representative Cretion has a comment. 
Thank you. Um, just to clarify, request of who to retain? Representative Thomas mentioned someone requested to retain. Can, yes, the prime sponsor, it? Representative oh, prime. Keith okay. Ammon, requested that this bill be retained. I am ready. Okay. I ask the clerk to call the roll on the question of retain for House Bill 558. Doug Thomas. Yes. Janine Nodder. Yes. Larry Gagney. Yes. Troy Murner. Yes. Charlie Melvin. Yes. Lex Brezhny. Yes. J.D. Bernardi. Yes. Tom Plaget. Yes. James Summers. Yes. Rebecca McWilliams. Yes. Rosemary Rung. Yes. Jackie Cretion. Yes. Lucius Parshall. Yes. Linda Ryan. Yes. Chris Munns. Yes. Henry Noel. Yes. Wendy Thomas. Yes. Thomas Corman. Yes. Ned Reynolds. Yes. Chairman Vose. Yes. 20 0. By a vote of 20 to 0, House Bill 558 has been judged to be worthy of retain by this committee. And so that will be ordered. And I'll close the exec session on House Bill 558. And before we open the next uh, exec session, we'll take a five minute recess for the committee to uh, relax and stretch its legs. We'll be back in five minutes. Who's who's writing the uh, on the um, eighty one? Who's writing the Doug? Doug? Okay.
Hi, Peter. How are you? Touching my leg as I'm speaking. <laughs> I realize you're unable to walk away. <laughs> Can I? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Five, two, three, five, two, four, six, one, six, two, thirty, one. Oh, man. We have a special that is looking into trying to get rid of some of the missions. We have some. Yeah, I, I understand. I mean, that's why the first. <laughs> so, my motive was if we just, we're going to do it no matter what. Right? So, let's not debate it on the floor. It's a waste of time. Let's just. Pass the damn thing and, and, and let it go. You know, it's not, I, I, want, I want to debate things that make sense. This is not So that's where I was. Get it on a consent calendar and be done with it.
Ladies and gentlemen, please retake your seats. Okay, let's resume our exec session, and I will put you all on notice that we are going to take our lunch break starting at 11 o'clock. And we will return at 12 o'clock to finish the business of the day if we have not finished it before that. And I don't anticipate that we will finish it before that. The reason for the early lunch hour is one of our members has to go present a bill to another committee. And so we'll need to take a break for that to happen. So we might as well be productive and have lunch and eat during that, that break. Well, okay. Back. Pardon? Okay. And if you could go find him, please. We'd like to resume our activity here this afternoon. So next, I'm going to open a... Executive session for House Bill 616 and recognize Representative Doug Thomas for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A motion on HB 616 is to retain. Representative Bernardi is recognized. Second the motion. It's been moved and seconded that we retain House Bill 616. Representative Doug Thomas is recognized. This bill is relative to administration of New Hampshire's renewable portfolio standard, and it's recommend. It was uh, sponsored by Representative Harrington, I believe. No. McLean. No, McWilliams. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, McLean. Representative McLean sponsored this one. McLean. Mark McLean. That's correct. I'm, Mark McLean. I am. Now I'm there. I'm, yeah, the representative Mark Lean submitted this bill. It had very interesting points, but we'd like to um, wait and see what happens uh, down line. Uh, uh, the uh, sponsor would like to see something out of it, but but uh, we we think that retaining uh, will allow us a little time to digest uh, parts of it. Uh, may be worth studying later on. We're not sure, but uh, that's the main reason for uh, retaining this bill. Further comments on the motion to retain Representative McWilliams. Thank you, Chair Vos. Um, there was a proposal as part of this bill to add nuclear to the renewable portfolio standard, which I think is a rather controversial move considering that nuclear actually does generate waste. Um, and so we're a little bit concerned about uh, lumping nuclear as part of our current renewable portfolio standard setup. Um, I do think that there may be something to look at if we retain this bill, and so I would support a retain, but my knee-jerk reaction would probably be ITL. So I'm going to vote retain and for those reasons. Further comment on the motion to retain House Bill 616. Representative Summers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm in favor of retaining as well. I know with the, the nuclear aspect, ironically, uh, President Biden just spoke in Poland this morning and said the United States is going to start building nuclear reactors in Poland. So um, I'm sure nuclear power will be changing here in the U.S. or possibly soon. Further comment on the motion to retain House Bill 616, Representative Doug Thomas. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just for clarification, uh, the uh, subject matter of uh, uh, nuclear was in terms of small-scale modular, which is the new, safe, small t uh, technology, and that is a basis of, uh, of in investigation uh, as opposed to the large-scale, which we have no, no desire for. Further comment? Representative Reynolds. Uh, I will not be voting in favor of the motion to retain this bill. I am all in favor of small modular nuclear technology coming to market. I don't see that happening. 
within a decade. Um, and even if it did, it would be inappropriate to um, call it renewable and lump it into the renewable portfolio standard as this bill would. So I'll be voting no on retain. Further comment? Seeing none. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion to retain House Bill 616. Doug Thomas. Yes. Janine Nodder. Yes. Larry Gagney. Yes. Troy Murner. Yes. Charlie Melvin. Yes. Lex Brezhny. Yes. J.D. Bernardi. Yes. Tom Ploge. Yes. James Summers. Yes. Rebecca McWilliams. Yes. Rosemary Rung. Yes. Jackie Cretion. No. Lucius Parshall. No. Linda Ryan. Yes. Chris Munns. No. Henry Noel. No. Wendy Thomas. No. Thomas Corman. No. Ned Reynolds. No. Chairman Bowes. Yes. 13 to 7. By a vote of 13 to 7, the committee will retain House Bill 616. And we will decide in the fall whether or not a subcommittee is necessary to complete our examination of this legislation. So with that, I'll close the exec session on House Bill 616. And now we will open an exec session on House Bill 622, and I'll recognize Representative J.D. Bernardi for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move ought to pass, and I offer an amendment. Representative Thomas. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we judge HB 622 to be ought to pass with an amendment. Rec Representative Bernardi. Yes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, in the discussion that we had on this bill and the hearing that we had on this bill, the, the largest concern was that we would be shutting off the opportunity for, for people to have a voice uh, periodically with the, <clears throat> with the Department of Energy. And so working with the Department of Energy crafted an amendment um, that uh, basically permits or requires the department to, at least on an annual basis, hold a meeting with a uh, large contingent of the pretty much the same folks that uh, that were in, engaged in the previous uh, easy board meetings. Uh, the amendment is is being passed around. It's. 0607H. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded that we amend House Bill 622 with Amendment 0607H. Hopefully, you all have a copy of the amendment by now. Is there any comment on the amendment? Representative Doug Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think the amendment uh, serves the purpose of what was the basic concern, and it allows the Department of Energy to um, hold uh, a hearing, a uh, meeting, I guess, uh, to uh, cover the same issues that uh, were in the um, um, easy board. Uh, I plan to vote for that. Further comment on the amendment as submitted by Representative Bernardi. Representative McWilliams. I just want to note for the record that the Energy Efficiency and Sustainable Energy Board was established in 2008. It consists of 18 members representing a cross-section of New Hampshire leadership, um, and it produces an annual report. So this amendment basically does a, instead of monthly meeting from this esteemed group, it looks like there is a once a year annual meeting with the Department of Energy to allow the public to air their grievances, uh, but I'm not seeing a report um, and I'm kind of feeling like this doesn't really move the ball forward on energy efficiency, uh, which is the cheapest dollar we can possibly spend, the megawatt, where we reduce our 
energy consumption by being smart about how we weatherize buildings. So for that reason, I'm, I'm concerned that this takes away the core intention of the Energy Efficiency and Sustainable Energy Board, lumps an annual meeting with some people uh, from the public allowed to attend and voice their concerns, but doesn't really push forward goals or report. Um, and for that reason, I would be against the amendment. Thank you. Additional comment. Representative Bernardi. Yes, as, uh, in reviewing the what the Easy Board does and comparing it to what the Department of Energy already does, uh, there was a redundancy there. There is a requirement to have an annual energy report that looks at all the energy issues in New Hampshire and, and uh, uh, energy efficiency certainly would be part of that. So the idea of l starting to limit the number of commissions and committees and whatnot that we have was the thrust of the entire bill. And the, the concern raised was, all right, we eliminated an opportunity to, for folks to have a voice. Well, that's been addressed by the amendment. So I, I, I believe the uh, principal um, rationale for not moving forward and consolidating activities has been removed. Representative Wendy Thomas has a comment. Thank you. I've got a clarification question on lines five through seven. Um, and I'm speaking as an instructional designer now. The department shall develop strategies, concepts, and tools to enhance outreach and education programs to increase knowledge and awareness. How on earth do you propose to measure any of those uh, goals to indicate success? I can uh, answer that uh, question as a member of the current member of the Easy Board. The Easy Board has a subcommittee that's charged with developing education and outreach programs, and they have issued an RFP because House Bill 549 last year allocated $400,000 to the Easy Board for uh, accomplishing the tasks described in lines five and six. And they have issued an RSP, RFP to do a survey to find out what the status of the public's awareness currently is so that they can develop future programs and tools to enhance the public's understanding. What this legislation would do is hand that task off to the Department of Energy. The Department of, of Energy already controls the $400,000 budget for this uh, procedure, this process. And so it's, it's unquestionably true that what Representative Bernardi characterized as a redundancy in statute already exists. And this legislation would clear up that redundancy by putting all the responsibility with the, uh, for executing this functionality with the Department of Energy, since they already control the purse strings. And furthermore, it would provide a way for public input uh, into that process, which I think is a superior way to handle this process going forward. As a member of the Easy Board, I can tell you that right now the Easy Board has very little power or to do anything and very little authority um, given the statutory changes that were made last year in House Bill 549. The one mission or the one um, task that they were charged with is developing the educational component. And so this simply moves that component into the Department of Energy and accomplishes the rest of what House Bill 549 set out to do, which was to uh, eliminate the easy board because it's no longer providing an essential function for the state. Representative Doug Thomas has a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And as the previous member of the Easy Board two years prior to the chair, I can vouch uh, with, with his concerns having 
sat through several meetings uh, that were basically presentations. Um, so uh, I think the uh, time and the term of the Easy Board has been surpassed now that we have the Department of Energy. Further comment? Representative Munns has a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what, one of the benefits of the the Easy Board, as I see it, is that it has um, members on it that represent different constituencies, uh, including the business community and the build and the and, and the Home Builders Association. And it's one thing to say that um, you know the department will conduct a public hearing to 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 which everybody is allowed to come and speak uh, to comment on decisions that the that the department is. Uh, contemplating or, or quite frankly has already made uh, that's a lot different than having those constituencies like the business community and the builders be part of the process of developing what the recommendation should be um, and um, since you know they're the ones that are going to be impacted the most by what some of these proposals are it would make seem to make sense to me to have them have a seat at the table in developing those, and as I can see it right now, the Easy Board is the only way that provides them that mechanism. Further comment? Representative Partial has a comment. Thank you, Chair. I would I would agree with, uh, with Representative Mums. Considering the current representation of the Easy Board, I welcome the redundancy from what may be a very different perspective and which may not be duplicated by an annual public comment meeting by, uh, on behalf of the general public. Representative Cretion has a comment. Speaking of redundancy, um, yes, just agreeing that while we all um, appreciate the urge to get rid of superfluous and unnecessary meetings, I think that a single annual meeting for public input is in no way um, sufficient for uh, the amount of input that needs to happen on these issues. Thanks. Okay, any further comment? Representative Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I want to say that while I, I do appreciate uh, the spirit of um, Representative Bernardi's efforts in, in crafting the amendment, and, and if I, you know, take the paragraphs five and six, especially, you know, at, at, on their face, I think that's, those are really laudable goals, but I, I also share the concerns um, that an annual meeting with sort of one way uh you know input public hearing style versus the the collaborative um style of the of the easy board function currently um is wouldn't wouldn't be satisfactory i mean i i can definitely see the the need to reduce perhaps the frequency of of easy board meetings from monthly to perhaps quarterly um but i i I guess I feel like this bill goes even even if amended as proposed would would sort of go too far. Thanks. Thank you for that comment. Since uh, the Easy Board has no real responsibility, no real authority, whether it meets monthly, weekly, quarterly, kind of doesn't matter if it really doesn't accomplish anything. That would be my comment. Knowing that Representative Bernardi has to leave here in five minutes, I'm going to ask that he call the roll on the question of the amendment to House Bill H-22, House uh, Amendment 2023-0607-H. Doug Thomas. Yes. Janine Nodder. Yes. Larry Gagney. Yes. Troy Merner. Yes. Charlie Melvin. Yes. Lex Brezhny. Yes. J.D. Bernardi, yes. Tom Ploget. Yes. James Summers. Yes. Rebecca McWilliams. No. Rosemary Rung. No. Jackie Cretion. No. Lucius Parshall. No. Linda Ryan. No. Chris Munns. No. Henry Noel. No. Wendy Thomas. No. Thomas Corman. No. Ned Reynolds. No. Chairman Vos. Yes. 10, 10. By a vote of 10 to 10, the amendment fails. amendment fails. I'll recognize Representative Doug Thomas for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, motion to retain this bill. Representative Bernardi. 
I second the motion. Moved and seconded to retain House Bill 622. Comment, Representative Thomas, Doug Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Retain will give us the time to go over some of the concerns expressed here uh, at, the, at this um, committee. And um, I think we owe it to the sponsor to uh, put forth the best effort to uh, uh, get accomplished what we want to get done. Representative Partial. Thank you, Chair. Um, I am starting, maybe you can assuage my uh, concern, but I am starting to uh, uh, look at the number of bills that we are retaining, and uh, it makes me a bit nervous. Additional comment? Seeing Rep Representative Rung? Yes, I, I have a point of order. Um, my notes say that there was an ought to pass motion made and seconded, and then um, the amendment was presented and we voted on that. Do we have to go back and vote on that OTP motion? Good question. I think that is correct. Yeah. We that do believe correct. that is correct. So, and instead of uh, discussing. I can withdraw that motion. Yes, you will withdraw. Okay, I'll Representative withdraw. Bernardi is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I withdraw the motion to OTP HB 622. Representative Thomas? Second. You withdraw so, your second. Wait. No, you're re you may retaining How can you withdraw it? you want to do this to retain? Yeah, I did. Re withdraw the second. Uh, withdraw the uh, retain. Okay, now you can make a new motion to retain. Oh, point of order. Yes. Um, so I guess now I'm confused. Um, we had a motion to ought to pass, and then underneath that motion we had an amendment. Since we don't, we have to finish the process I mean, because if the motion had been to retain, we wouldn't have introduced the amendment. Well, the original motion was ought to pass, and then Representative Bernardi offered Amendment 0607H. The amendment failed, so that returns us back to the ought to pass motion, as Representative Rung pointed out. Representative Bernardi then withdrew the ought to pass motion, meaning there's no motion on the floor. I I understand. So I'm asking Representative Thomas to make a motion to retain. I, I understand that. I, I thought we'd have to finish the process of voting, but okay. And so the motion is to retain. Representative Bernardi. Second the motion. Moved and seconded to retain. Any further comment? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the motion on, call the roll rather on the motion to retain House Bill 622. Doug Thomas. Yes. Janine Nodder. Yes. Larry Gagne. Yes. Troy Murner. Yes. Charlie Melvin. Yes. Lex Brezhny. Yes. J.D. Bernardi. Yes. Tom Ploget. Yes. James Summers. Yes. Rebecca McWilliams. Yes. Rosemarie Rung. Yes. Jackie Cretion. Yes. Lucius Parshall. No. Linda Ryan. Yes. Chris Munns. No. Henry Noel. No. Wendy Thomas. No. Thomas Corman. No. Ned Reynolds. Yes. Chairman Bowes. Yes. 15-5. By a vote of 15 to 5, the committee retains House Bill 622. And with that, we will close the executive session on House Bill 622. And we will go into a lunch recess until... 12 p.m. And I will see everyone back here at that time. Thank you. One floor down. Where are you going? Huh? Oh. Children and family law. Oh, okay. I'll see
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Okay, let us resume our executive session activity for this Tuesday, which I'm told is Mardi Gras Day. So it's a day for us all to uh, celebrate, I guess. Is it also called Fat Tuesday? Yeah. All right. Well, we've all just had lunch, so. Laisse les bons temps rouler. Thank you. Let the good times roll. Right. All right. Well, <clears throat> with that in mind, we'll have some fun here for the next hour or so. So I'm going to open a public hearing on House Bill 219 FN relative to certain public utilities statutes. And I will move ought to pass and offer amendment 2023-04618, and I recognize Representative Nodder. I'll second your motion, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt Amendment 0461H to House Bill 219. Since it's my amendment, I will explain it to you. During the public hearing, it was revealed to us that the... RSAs targeted for repeal in the original legislation were actually, many of them were actually needed. And instead of being repealed, they needed to be recodified in a different part of statute. And that's what the study committee that this bill created, that's what its job was to do, was to figure out what bills need to be recodified and where. So what this amendment does is that it, it took all of the RSAs starting on, as what you'll see in the amendment, starting on line 20 and going through to line one on page two, it moved all of those RSAs from the repeal section of the legislation into the study committee section of the, le of the legislation. The only piece of, the only statute that remained in the repeal section was RSA 376A relative to transportation network companies. And that section was recodified in the original bill in the proper place. That's uh, now 350, RSA 359-U. So that's what the amendment did. It, it kept that one section in the repeal section because it's been recodified already and it put everything else in the study committee section of the bill. So it's a pretty simple amendment and uh, I ask for your support. And now I look for comment on the amendment. Representative Munns has a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I did, I did look this, this amendment over and, um, I think it accomplishes everything that, uh, you stated and is consistent with the concerns raised in the hearing. So to me, it, um, it, it, it's certainly something that we should adopt. Thank you. Additional comments on this legis on this amendment rather. Representative Bernardi. This is a question, Mr. Chair. Uh, did the. Uh, other department heads uh, that had testified and raised issues, did they agree with this? Have they seen it? Or, or we, it just wholesale, you did it, so it's, you know, we don't even need to know. Actually, the, uh, one of the, I'm not sure if it was a commissioner or one of the staffers at the Department of Transportation called me out of the room just this morning to tell me that she and the department endorsed this uh, Amendment. So yes, the Department of Transportation 
and most of these RSA will RSAs will be recodified under the department, and uh, they agreed with with everything. So, Representative Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I agree, and I totally urge uh, everyone to support the chair's amendment. Additional comments on the amendment. Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk. Representative Partial. Thank you, Chair Vos. I agree with this passage as well. Thank you. Seeing no further comments, I'll ask the clerk to, clerk to call the roll on Amendment 2023-0461H. Doug Thomas. Yes. Janine Nodder. Yes. Larry Gagne. Yes. Troy Murner. Yes. Charlie Melvin. Yes. Lex Brezhny. Yes. J.D. Bernardi. Yes. Tom Ploget. Yes. James Summers. Yes. Rebecca McWilliams. Yes. Rosemary Rung. Yes. Jackie Cretion. Yes. Lucius Partial. Yes. Linda Ryan. Yes. Chris Munns. Yes. Henry Noel. Yes. Wendy Thomas. Yes. Thomas Corman. Yes. Ned Reynolds. Yes. Chairman Vos. Yes. 20 0. By a vote of 20 to nothing, the amendment is adopted. I now move ought to pass as amended and recognize Representative Thomas. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt House Bill 219FN as amended. Is there any further discussion? Representative McWilliams. Thank you, Chair Vos. Um, I would just like to commend you, Mr. Chair, uh, for taking the time to develop a really great amendment and also to do the work to review these statutes that need to be reviewed. So thank you. I absolutely support this. Thank you. I appreciate your comment. Any further comments? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the question of OTPA on House Bill 219-FN. Doug Thomas. Yes. Janine Nodder. Yes. Larry Gagne. Yes. Troy Marner. Yes. Charlie Melvin. Yes. Lex Brezhny. Yes. J.D. Bernardi. Yes. Tom Ploget. Yes. James Summers. Yes. Rebecca McWilliams. Yes. Rosemary Rung. Yes. Jackie Cretion. Yes. Lucius Partial. Yes. Linda Ryan. Yes. Chris Munns. Yes. Henry Noel. Yes. Wendy Thomas. Yes. Thomas Corman. Yes. Ned Reynolds. Yes. Chairman Vos. Yes. 20 to 0. By a vote of 20 to 0, House Bill 219 FN will go to the House floor with a recommendation of yeah. ought to pass. Consent. As amended, without objection, this bill will go on the consult, consent calendar. Okay. Representative Rung? Um, it has an FN, so I, I think... Ah, that's right. Uh, Good point. Right. Thanks for pointing that out. So it can't go on the, on the consent calendar, so it'll go on the regular calendar, and I will write the committee report. Seeing nothing further, I'll close the exec session on House Bill 219 FN. Next... Next, we will move to House Bill 523, and I'll recognize Representative Berezny for a motion. Thank you, Chairman. I move that we ITL 523 FN. Representative Summers is recognized. I second the motion. It's been moved and seconded that we ITL House Bill 523. Representative Berezny. Thank you. Uh, during the testimony, um, I believe the DOE testified that there's an open docket, DE 22-060, to study net metering, uh, and they were against the bill because they would like to have that docket finish and, and have the findings uh, before we make any more changes to net metering. Also, last year, HB 1599-FN passed, which, re which requested the uh, PUC to do a study on net metering. Uh, so it doesn't make sense that we ask them to do a study and then at the same time make changes. Thank you. Further comment on the motion to ITL House Bill 3, uh, 523. Representative Partial. Yes, I see this bill as offering a more immediate relief. And considering that we have industries in our state that are unable to take advantage of economy scale, 
by having a five megawatt limit. Industries such as Anheuser Busch, who instead of lowering their energy costs, are forced to make layoffs. I see this as a, a relief bill for those for those industries that are troubled by it. And I don't see any problem because the one megawatt was an arbitrary figure to begin with. I don't see any problem with going ahead and passing this legislation, which, which we heard testimony could also potentially benefit uh, consumer rates. I just see that the need, well, again, justice delayed is justice denied. I'll leave it at that. Further comment on the motion to ITL House Bill 523, Representative Wendy Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, during the hearing, we heard um, about the, the positive jobs impact um, of, of raising this limit. And this bill was also described as a business enabling bill. I just wanted to remind people of that. Thank you. Representative Reynolds is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, I'm uh, not in favor of inexpedient to legislate. I'm in favor of passing this bill, the uh, one megawatt limit on the scale of distributed generation that can interconnect is a, is a completely arbitrary limit, and it's a limit that makes a lot of potentially viable distributed generation uneconomic because of there's a lot of fixed costs to developing any project and to interconnecting it to the grid. Um, and therefore, when all of those fixed costs are forced to be um, borne by a, a, uh, a generation asset that is arbitrarily limited uh, to a relatively small scale, uh, it, it, makes it makes those projects uneconomic for business to pursue. Um, you know, one of the desires we all have is to have more distributed generation be uh, economic and be able to deliver low cost energy for businesses um, and institutions and municipalities um, in our state. And so uh, I'm in favor of expanding the limit to five megawatts. Thank you. Representative Doug Thomas has a comment. Yes, Mr. Chair, just <clears throat> I have to agree uh, with the um, uh, um, <clears throat> with uh, Representative Brezhnev's comments about the uh, PUC. They are in consultation right now with, with their docket, and anything we do now can just cause some, some uh, confusion. I, I'm all one for waiting to see what, what the PUC does, and from there we can go on to, to do better things, but I don't think we should do something now that's going to confuse them later on. Additional comment, Representative Corman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, regarding the PUC, I mean, we're the legislature. We have oversight over them. So I'm, I'm not as concerned about the PUC docket. Uh, but I was also going to point out that during testimony from um, the representative from IBEW Local 490, he talked about some of the facilities in state already that really could take advantage of going over one megawatt. Uh, you mentioned Associated Grocers in Pembroke, Anheuser-Busch in Merrimack. Uh, a school in Dover, and and he said, and I, I, I this really struck me that it would be like giving a tax break to businesses because it's lowering their operating costs. And I know that there's a lot of interest in the legislature to giving tax breaks to businesses. This would have the same effect. I have to respond to that. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Who would pay for that tax break, though? That's the question. Would you want ratepayers to pay well, for that I mean, tax that, break? That, that happens in any tax break, right? The, the slack has to get taken up or, or budget has to get cut for any tax break. But this is a hidden tax break that nobody would see. Is that fair? Just a rhetorical question. Uh, Representative, uh, let's see, do we have any other comments? Okay, yeah, I'll let you make a second comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, no, no. I would say in response to your your question there, um, that's the wonderful thing about renewable energy. As I mentioned in my uh, testimony, the fuel cost of renewable energy is zero. So in making it more possible for more people to harness more renewable energy, the, the wonderful thing is that the value 
The additional value doesn't have to come from others. It comes from, from nature. It's free for the taking if we just remove arbitrary limits and we allow, again, these are private investors to build generation on their own facilities with their own money. Uh, and they're just harnessing the value that is, is available to all of us. Thanks for allowing me. Okay, to additional comments. Representative Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just comment on that, uh, which was, um, I think the question was asked in committee here. Uh, there is no regulation that prevents people from putting more solar out there whatsoever. Nothing. Okay. Representative Murner has a comment. Yeah, we have gone round and round with this last few years, and I had two big projects in the North Country, and it is free to harness, and it is, but these people will not invest unless we give them the give them the money. So they want us to pay for this through, you know, to increase that one megawatt. And I get calls all the time on projects. You know, they're not going to do it unless they get that increase. So they want they want the ratepayers to pay for their projects. That's and and to subsidize this stuff. So I'm in total agreement with uh, Representative Presney. Representative Parshall had his hand up first. Yes, thank you, Chair. I do believe that our uh, um, consumer advocate t gave testimony that these uh, that this will serve as a load reducer, and doing as much, it has a very strong potential to reduce consumer rates. And I'm for all for reducing the rates that our consumers are paying. Representative Cretion has a comment. Yes, just commenting on, um, I believe we're referring to cost shifting, and I believe that the recent VDER report pretty unequivocally showed that that is not happening. So it is not that these projects are, are costing money to the ratepayers. We're simply taking that offline. Thanks. Representative Bernardi had us a comment. I believe that VDR report said that the amount of cost shifting was not significant at one megawatt. But if you raise it to five megawatts, the opportunity there is for much more. Additional comment. May I respond? Representative Cretion. Um, considering that that report came out before the most recent spike in natural gas prices, I think there's uh, impacts on both sides that we can consider. Additional comment. Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the question of ITL for House Bill 523. Doug Thomas. Yes. Janine Nodder. Yes. Larry Gagney. Yes. Troy Murner. Yes. Charlie Melvin. Yes. Lex Brezhny. Yes. J.D. Bernardi. Yes. Tom Ploget. Yes. James Summers. Yes. Rebecca McWilliams. No. Rosemary Rung. No. Jackie Cretion. No. Lucius Parshall. No. Linda Ryan. No. Chris Munns. No. Henry Noel. No. Wendy Thomas. No. Thomas Corman. No. Ned Reynolds. No. Chairman Vos. Yes. 10-10. By a vote of 10 to 10, the motion to ITL fails. And I'll remind all members that if there are no further motions made, this bill will go to the floor without recommendation. Having said that, I'll ask the question, are there any other motions to be made on this bill? Representative McWilliams. This is just a question. Um, having previously done this where we had to vote ITL, OTP, retain for every bill, I understand we're going to send this to the floor without recommendation. Does that still mean that the default without recommendation starts with an OTP? Yeah. I just want to clarify that. Yeah. Yes, it Thank does. You. That's all I wanted to know. Okay. Are there any other motions to be made from the floor? Seeing none, we'll send this uh, bill to the floor without recommendation. And uh, Representative James Summers will write the statement for ITL. Who will write the statement for OTP? Representative Parshall. Representative Parshall will write the statement in support of 
OTP. With that, we'll close the executive session on House Bill 523, and we'll open an executive session on House Bill 524, the very next bill on the list. And the chair will recognize Troy Murder for a motion. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move ITL on 524. Chair recognizes Representative Cloger. I will second the motion. It's been moved and seconded that we ITL House Bill 524 relative to regional greenhouse gas initiative funds. Comments and discussion? Representative Murner, did you want to say anything? I know that this is going to be seeing the state of what we're paying for energy right now would increase that thing from a dollar to three dollars on the um, money and it would be an impact of roughly like seven million dollars to the ratepayers. Further discussion? Representative Munns. Thank you Mr. Chair. Um, the the impact on ratepayers um, is w would be minimal in terms of the monthly impact. Um, I think we're talking about something between you know a dollar and two dollars at most um, and quite frankly the impact of that would um, you know not be not be felt if the price of Rex continues to increase as they have been. Uh, we're only talking about a two dollar increase in the amount of money that would go towards the um, um, renewable uh, energy fund. Uh, is it the renewable energy fund? The uh, the the energy efficiency fund. Um, which is minimal, and as I said, as the prices go up, uh, the impact on consumers is going to be, um, they're not going to feel it at all. Representative Summers has a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I find it fascinating. I was counting up how many bills that have been through this committee that have been, in fact, even tabled in the last session and that we've been discussed here. And every time it's stated that well, this will only be $1, $2, $3 per rate payer. And then if we would actually would take all of these and pass all of them, including this one, that, that little bit $1, $2, what well, are we expecting to get everybody, okay, fine, you're going to pay $50 more a month, $60 more a month? What are we actually looking forward to? You get you all keep saying that we're going to raise it a dollar or two, but it's going up astronomically, especially if we passed all these. Representative Cretion has a comment. With respect, many of these bills are related to the same single dollar. We just kind of keep going around in circles about where it should go. Um, I obviously was in favor of the similar bill where we would send all of the Reggie money back to where it belongs in Reggie. Um, I think this would be a compromise step to send a bit more of it closer to what was originally there. Um, if we're really concerned about reducing rates, I think we have other means to do that, like the bill that we did at the end of last session where we were literally giving the money. But Reggie money is meant for energy efficiency. It should go to energy efficiency. Thank you. Representative Bernardi has a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I'm also in favor of selling, sending all the Reggie money back to where it belongs, and I think it belongs in the hands of the ratepayers. All of it. What we keep hearing is, uh, uh, you know, a nickel here, a dollar here, a dollar there. It reminds me of like Everett Dirksen when he stood up on the House floor and said, said. Pretty soon you're talking about real money. You know, it just, it's unbelievable that we want to raise rates on rate payers. I don't care if it's 10 cents or $10. It's inappropriate at this time, period. Representative Wendy Thomas has a comment. Thank you. Um, just, um, we're in discussion. Um, that eloquent speech that we just heard about not raising any rates, but yet we just voted on a bill to fund a study committee for $25,000. So that seems to be uh, a little bit of confusion about that. Um, this was a, a bill the other day. Um, but originally this bill was supposed to be um, in law. It was supposed to be $6 from Reggie was supposed to be used. And this bill asks for $3, which is a very conservative approach to bring the action into compliance with what was supposed to originally be. Thank you. Additional comments. Representative Reynolds had his hand up. Yes. Um, yes, notwithstanding the rhetorical 
flourish from both Representative Summers and Representative Bernardi about us seemingly talking about adding more and more money or taking more and more money from ratepayers. We we have been having the same debate over and over in this committee about really two funds, which are the Energy Efficiency Fund and the Renewable Energy Fund. And both of those funds, of course, are funded by these small charges that have been on a part of New Hampshire's energy policy for over a decade. And um, both are intended to reduce, uh, to fund investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency that reduce customers' bills and reduce our dependence and exposure uh, to fossil fuels. I know that all of everyone on this committee is hearing from their constituents about their high energy bills. One of the first things out of all of our mouths when we're talking to our constituents ought to be, um, you know, the energy costs come from the global fossil fuel market. There's not much we can do about that. But one of the things, one of the first things you should do is access the New Hampshire Saves Program and find ways and get financial assistance in reducing your energy use, and that will reduce your energy bill. People pay bills, they don't pay rates. So, you know, we ha I had a side conversation with Representative Thomas where he told me that he'd, he'd referred one of his constituents to the New Hampshire Saves programs, and I thought that was great. And that's what we all should be doing. But when we underfund these programs like we're doing with this $1 of the Reg G allowance money going to the Energy Efficiency Fund, the program is starved for funds, and when people reach out and call it, they re are regularly told, oh, the program's out of money for this year. You'll, you'll have to, you know, we can take your application now, but you won't, um, you won't be able to access anything for, you know, six months or nine months. So we shouldn't have that happening, especially in this environment. We should be funding the energy efficiency program, you know, with a relatively meager portion of the Reggie allowance money, as we've heard. And, and then referring all of our constituents to that. Thank you. The New Hampshire Saves Program is hardly starved for funds. Its funds have increased from 32 million to 73 million since 2017. Representative Doug Thomas has a comment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> you know, everything that everyone has said here so far is true in their own way. Um, but I think more about the times we're in right now. And if you look at all the money that Massachusetts has thrown against um, their efforts to raise renewable energy, and you, and you look at their rates, their rates, they may be close to ours, but they're still a little bit higher. So they really haven't gained much ground in, in that. But what I'm looking at right now, and, and I thought about this bill, I thought about the fact that maybe it's, you know, with things where they are, that uh, there could be some movement here. But then I look around and, and see where we are right now with the high energy prices, the high electricity prices. And I said, this is not the time to make this move. It just isn't. Um, we can talk about what it can do five years from now, but I think people want to see what things can be done right now for them. So I can't support this bill. I have to support the ITEL on this bill. Representative Corman has a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm looking over my notes uh, from during testimony, and when Mr. Fontaine from DES was here, uh, he pointed out that the uh, savings from energy efficiency do reduce demand, and in particular transmission costs, because that's that le much less energy that actually needs to be transmitted. So there are some savings that get spread throughout the whole system. Uh, John Mann also talked about the multiplier effect, how, how the savings from energy efficiency goes back into the economy. So you know, there are some, some impacts here that are you know, definitely positive impacts that, that I think we should be considering. Additional comments? Representative Partial. Yes, thank you, Chair. We've had some of these policies, such as dredgy energy efficiency programs, going back to, to 2008. And the moment, from the moment they were conceived, they're immediately crippled uh, by, and, and money was siphoned off in ways that the original bill was not intended. Many of my constituents know that if we had invested back in those days in some of these programs, we would not be in the state we are in today. And most of my constituents from speaking with them, I know they're happy for the few pennies paying the bill 
under the belief we're going to be able to eventually get out of the thumb of fossil fuels. And as far as Massachusetts uh, and their investment in, in uh, renewable energies, Massachusetts does not set their own rates any more than New Hampshire or Vermont do. ISO New England sets the rates. And in fact, uh, if rates are inflated because of natural gas prices, it's states like Massachusetts and Vermont who have, in, who have initiated very aggressive renewable energy policies that end up paying for it more than we do. And I just think that's really not, well, it's just not right. Okay, thank you. Representative Munz has a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I first want to apologize to the committee for mixing up renewable energy credits and reggie allowances. Um, we're talking about reggie allowances here, and uh, uh, I apologize for that. And, and to Representative Summers' point, I mean, we have been throwing around numbers, um, you know, quite a bit. Um, but as somebody said earlier, um, those numbers are not additive. And, and it's important to keep in, in mind the context of what we're talking about. Based on the number, based on the fact that this would divert or, or this would restore about $6.5 million uh, in funds to efficiency efforts, and based on the fact that we were, we've were we been told in previous testimony that there are about 757,000 customers in New, in, New, in New Hampshire, that is equivalent to about 83 cents a month uh, for every customer. And I think if you ask anybody, you know, are you willing to make an investment of 83 cents a month with the idea that this will hope this will help reduce demand and 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 increase the amount of renewable energy so that we're not as reliant on fossil fuels, particularly natural gas, which is at a premium now in the worldwide market. I don't think there's anybody in the state that wouldn't say they, they would make that small investment of 83 cents. <clears throat> additional, <clears throat> excuse me, additional comments. Representative Summers. Just a quick one, just to remind everybody that in when I was here in 2010 on this very committee, um, it was actually that crippling that was actually written by the Senate to save Reggie, that in 2010, we actually voted in this committee and in the House to repeal Reggie altogether. And the Senate actually ended up um, defeating that by actually setting it to the $1 standard, if I remember correctly. Thanks for that bit of history. Additional comments? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the question of ITL for House Bill 524. Doug Thomas. Yes. Janine Nodder. Yes. Larry Gagney. Yes. Troy Murner. Yes. Charlie Melvin. Yes. Lex Brezhny. Yes. J.D. Bernardi. Yes. Tom Plochet. Yes. James Summers. Yes. Rebecca McWilliams. No. Rosemary Rung. No. Jackie Cretion. No. Lucius Parshall. No. Linda Ryan. No. Chris Munns. No. Henry Noel. No. Thomas or Wendy Thomas. No. Thomas Corman. No. Ned Reynolds. No. Chairman Vose. Yes. 10 10. By a count of 10 to 10, the motion to ITL House Bill 524 fails. And I would ask the committee if there are any alternative motions to be made. Seeing none, House Bill 524 will be sent to the House floor without recommendation. Representative Troy Murner will write the statement in support of ITL. Who will write the statement in support of OTP? Representative Munns. Munns? Okay. So with that, we'll close the public hearing on House Bill 524. We have two to go. Three. Don't forget 161. You added that 161 to the yeah. bottom. That makes two. Two, 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 two. Oh. Oh, I didn't check one off here. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. All right, we're, we yeah. are, I was correct. We have two bills left to go. <clears throat> the next one up is House Bill 631-FN. 
relative to electric utility smart meter gateway devices. And I recognize Representative James Summers for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I make the motion to ITL this bill. And I recognize Representative Tom Ploger. I will second that. It's been moved and seconded that we ITL House Bill 631-FN. Discussion from the committee. Representative Summers. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I was uh, actually going to ITL this bill. And the only reason why you all have heard of me complaining about increasing rates to ratepayers or the cost of their bill to the ratepayers. And uh, with this one, it was testimony by um, not only Eversource, and then with the seconded by the Department of Energy that, in fact, that the, um, the utilities would have to provide um, different models of metering as far as actually um, inventory, which would increase inventory costs and the in inventory value, and that that actual inventory would be passed on to the ratepayers, therefore my TL. Further discussion on this uh proposed legislation. Representative Munns. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I've been struggling with this, and, 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 it's, and it's kind of a chicken and the egg problem. Um, the, um, you, the utilities can't offer consumers opportunities to save money by um, deciding when to, um, you know, use power. They can't offer time of use rates um, without smart meters. Um, but, um, without, um, without the consumers paying for it, you can't have, you can't have the smart meters. And, and, you know, I don't know how many consumers are going to be willing to pay to shell out $250. Um, and it also limits the, 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 the fact that, um, the majority of households in the state do not have these devices limits what utilities can do. In, in terms of innovative other ways to control power, tr the whole area of transactive energy. Um, and so I've been trying to figure out if there are a way that we can, you know, somehow get these meters in the hands of people without um, the individuals having to incur a significant impact. I did some research and have had some preliminary conversations with the Department of Energy that there does appear to be some federal programs that would allow um, utilities to pay for these, that would fund utilities paying for these meters. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a grant process that, that they'd have to go through. And I'm just wondering if there isn't a way that we couldn't spend a couple, spend a little bit of, of time here um, re recessing this, this bill for a couple weeks and just see if we can craft something that would make some sense that would get smart meters uh, installed in our state so we can begin moving forward with some of these cost-saving opportunities. Representative Berezny is recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so my understanding is that this bill is specifically for smart meter gateway devices and not just smart meters. And if I remember when um, the representative from Eversource testified, he said that um, an example of a gateway device is just an appliance that knows based on other factors, whether it should uh, decrease or increase consumption, such as a, um, a thermostat, for example. And people can buy a smart thermostat today that will increase or decrease based on what time of day and, and similar things. So I think if we're talking about smart meters, that that's probably a different bill than this one. Thank you. Further discussion? Representative Bernardi has a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so uh, Mr. Licata from uh, Eversource sent me an email. I don't know if you all got the same email, uh, but he answered some of the questions that he seemed to uh, not have full answers to during the hearing. And one of them was uh, whether AMR and AMI meters have the capability of, of uh, doing time of day uh, rates. Both do. The difference is AMI meters have much greater granularity. The AMR meter is more of a yes or no type uh, meter. Um, and then with respect to where Eversource is in Connecticut, 
they are in front of the PUC to uh, uh, move forward with a plan to uh, put AMI meters throughout the state of Connecticut. Representative Cretion has a comment. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, so as the prime sponsor of the bill, I yes, my intention um, was to ask for AMI devices to be offered for purchase, not that we want Eversource or, or any utility to necessarily be providing them for free. Um, I thought that that was a good compromise. We did hear testimony that some of our other utilities already have quite a few customers on AMI devices. Um, I think that it would be nice for Eversource customers to also have that option. Um, but yes, I agree with uh, Representative Munns that perhaps this bill needs a little bit more work to to be finally ready. And I would ask uh, for your professional courtesy in retaining the bill. Thank you. Additional comment. Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the question of ITL for House Bill 631. Doug Thomas. Yes. Janine Notter. Yes. Larry Gagney. Yes. Troy Murner. Yes. Uh, Charlie Melvin. Yes. Lex Brezhny. Yes. J.D. Bernardi. Yes. Tom Plogé. Yes. James Summers. Yes. Rebecca McWilliams. No. Rosemary Rung. No. Jackie Cretion. No. Lucius Parshall. No. Linda Ryan. No. Chris Munns. No. Henry Noel. No. Wendy Thomas. No. Thomas Corman. No. Ned Reynolds. No. Chairman Vos. Yes. 10, 10. So by a vote of 10 to 10, the motion to ITL House Bill 631 fails. Will there be an alternative motion, Representative McWilliams? Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that we retain House Bill 631, and I believe I have a second over there. Yes, I would second that motion. It's been moved and seconded that we retain House Bill 631. Is there further discussion? Representative Partial. Yes, we definitely need grid modernization in order to take advantage of such things as uh, time of day usage. Uh, smart meter would allow that. Uh, if there's potential money that could be gained by retaining this bill and other sources of that, I think that the sooner we push on this, the lower we can uh, reduce our peak demands, and the sooner we can offer some real rate relief to our customers, to our constituents. Further discussion on the motion to retain. Representative Corman has a Thank comment. you, Mr. Chairman. W one other aspect of time of use that we really need to be thinking about is that we're going to be seeing more and more people wanting to charge their EVs at home as EV sales increase. And this is regardless of how any of us feel about EVs, what counts is how the chairman of the board of GM and Ford and Volkswagen and those companies feel about EVs. EVs are coming and people are going to want to charge them. They're going to be wanting to charge them at times when the rates are lower. So that is going to be a way that we can actually lower rates in a significant way as people are using larger amounts of power. It would be great if they could do it at a time with a lower rate. Representative Cretion has another comment. Thank you. Um, yes, just one other comment um, in response to, I guess, the assertion that needing to offer these would force Eversource to increase its rates. Um, just want to comment that that's always a choice that they make. They could choose to take it out of CEO compensation um, or perhaps something else. Um, we're not making them <laughs> increase their rates. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? I'll make a comment here in that I think that we've, we've already decided today to retain seven out of the 12 bills that we're hearing. If we decide to retain this bill, that'll be eight out of 12. That's two thirds of the bills that we've heard today we've retained. We had 40 bills in committee this year. If we retain two thirds of them, that'll leave us with 30 bills to deal with this fall. I think maybe we have, we ought to seriously rethink whether we're doing the right thing here by retaining these bills. I don't see a pass forward for this bill 
there are too many obstacles in the way for this to become successful legislation the way I see it. The Department of Energy has indicated they don't see a path forward. Eversource has indicated that they don't see a need for this bill. We've got the Community Power Aggregation Program coming online this spring, where over 125,000 New Hampshire customers will be getting their power through community power aggregation. And that organization plans to supply smart meters to customers who want it. There just doesn't seem to me to be a worthwhile path forward. And so why should we retain a bill that's not going to go anywhere? That would be my comment. Representative Munns. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it, you know, there, there is some, some new information that apparently there is money available through the uh, federal, some of the federal bills that have been passed. Um, it does require action on the part of the utilities, but um, I think there may be an opportunity to get funding. So that's one thing. The second thing is, couldn't agree with you more about the fact that we're retaining so many bills. Um, and, um, you know, but, but we've honored requests from other members to retain bills. We have a member and prime sponsor that is asking to retain this bill. And I think we need to be consistent. And if we decide not to honor that request, then I think we should go back and look at some of the bills that we voted, that we've voted to retain based on similar requests. Okay, further comments? I guess we'll all have to just vote our conscience on this bill, so I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the question of retain on House Bill 631. Doug Thomas. Unfortunately, I think we're right that we're retaining too many bills, so I'll have to say no. Janine Nodder. No. Larry Gagney. No. Troy Murner. No. Charlie Melvin. No. Lex Brezhny. Yes. J.D. Bernardi. No. Tom Ploget. Yes. James Summers. Yes. Ro uh, Rebecca Mc McWilliams. Yes. Rosemary Rung. Yes. Jackie Cretion. Yes. Lucius Parshall. Yes. Linda Ryan. Yes. Chris Munns. Yes. Henry Noel. Yes. Wendy Thomas. Yes. Thomas Corman. Yes. Ned Reynolds. Yes. Chairman Vos. No. 13 to 7. By a vote of 13 to 7, the committee votes to retain House Bill 631. And the number is now up to eight out of 12. <clears throat> I don't see any need for a subcommittee on this bill at this time. If we decide we need one, we can form one in the fall. So we'll close the public, uh, the um, exec session on House Bill 631. And we have one to go. Representative Wendy Thomas is waiting on bated breath to get to another uh, committee room to testify on a bill. So let's see if we can get through this one quickly. That's House Bill 161. Open an executive session on HB 161 relative to customer generators of electricity as group hosts under net metering. And the chair recognizes Representative Lex Berezny for a motion. I motion that we ITL HB 161 and I can speak to my motion. Chair recognizes Representative Summers. I second that motion. Been moved and seconded that we ITL House Bill 161. Representative Berezny is recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so my reason to ITL this one is the same as the uh, previous bill that I, um, 523, is that the uh, Department of Energy would like to see the um, docket with the POC on net metering completed before we make any substantial changes. And uh, there was a point made before uh, on the previous, on that bill, that uh, it's up to the legislature to tell the PUC what to do. 
And in fact, we did. HB 1599 last year that we passed told the PUC to investigate updating uh, the net, net metering. So I think if we told them to do that, it makes sense to let them finish before we tell them to do something different. Thank you. Additional comment on the motion to ITL HB 161. Representative Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, against the motion to um, ITL 161, we all got a, I believe we all got a email from uh, Jim Monahan that was helpful clarifying that uh, this bill is, is not any kind of major change to um, net metering policy. It's really a, a clarification. Um, or the correction of perhaps an omission in the past. It's not about uh, allowing double counting. No one wants any double counting. It's, it's really just allowing a facility that may already be a net metering facility, but whose generation is much smaller than its needs to also participate in a group net metering arrangement so that uh, net metering um, distributed generation somewhere else can help help meet its load. So this is just a refinement of existing policy, in my view. Thank you. Thank you. Further comment? Representative McWilliams. Um, I'd just like to say that the folks who are able to take advantage of this legislation, if we were to pass it out of committee, are people who are dedicated already to purchasing renewable energy. They probably already have solar panels on their rooftop. It's not creating enough energy to completely um, run their household. And so they'd like to then take advantage of purchasing from uh, group, group uh, solar elsewhere in the state, and they'd like to be able to do both. That doesn't mean double dipping. It means they'd like to have all renewables. So um, in terms of this as an alternative to something like offshore wind, I know we've had some concerns that there may be whales killed in the making of offshore wind. This is an alternative to allow people to just buy their renewables from a group net metering for solar. Thank you. Additional comments? It would seem to me that this bill is <clears throat> an expansion of group host net metering and the governor has consistently veto vetoed uh, net metering expansion bills over the course of the last four or five years. I think uh, should this bill emerge from committee successfully and, and emerge from the House successfully, it would never either get through the Senate or pass the governor. I think the, the best path forward for this bill is to simply wait and see what future net metering tariffs are going to look like. And we'll know that once the current net metering docket is completed. And I think there's no need for any change in net metering policy, especially policy that is likely to go nowhere before uh, we get to that point. Seeing no further comment, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the question of ITL on House Bill 161. Doug Thomas. Yes. Janine Nodder. Yes. Larry Gagney. Yes. Troy Murner. Yes. Charlie Melvin. Yes. Lex Brezhny. Yes. J.D. Bernardi. Yes. Tom Floget. Yes. James Summers. Yes. Rebecca McWilliams. No. Rosemary Rung. No. Jackie Cretion. No. Lucius Parshall. No. Linda Ryan. No. Chris Munns. Henry Noel. No. Wendy Thomas. No. Thomas Corman. No. Ned Reynolds. No. Chairman Vose. Yes. 1010. By a vote of 1010, this bill fails to achieve a vote of ITL from the committee. Are there any additional motions that need to be made from the floor? Seeing none. We'll send this committee to the House floor without recommendation. And Lex, Ber Ber excuse me, Lex Berezny will write the statement in support of ITL. And who will write the statement in support of OTP? Representative Reynolds. Okay. 
So Representative Reynolds, did you get that? We'll write the statement in support of OTP and Representative Brezhne will write the statement in support of ITL. And with that, we will close the executive session on House Bill 161. And Representative Wendy Thomas, we got it done by one o'clock. Very much appreciated, thank you. Representative Thomas, hang on a second. Representative Werner. I think she's on the subcommittee for House Bill 257. Are you part of it? Okay. I want to meet next Thursday at 10 a.m., if that's okay. I discussed it with uh, Representative Munns this morning. I'll do it on Thursday because the first three days of the week I'm tied up. Is that okay? Yeah. And some, Jim, is that okay with you? Thursday at 10 a.m. Next Thursday, yeah. Good. Any other announcements from members of the committee? Thank you. Seeing none, I guess we'll see you all tomorrow morning, bright and early, in House chambers for uh, this February 22nd House session, and again on uh, the 23rd for another House session. So. Safe travels home, and thank you all for your hard work today. Take care.